Good morning. Wow, we're a little bit loud this morning. Um, <clears throat> we're continuing along in our series called Death to Selfie. And uh, today I am looking at a, a, a wonderful Old Testament passage. There's some really rich stories in the Old Testament. And uh, today's passage is 1 Kings 21. 1 Kings 21. And uh, in, this, uh, in this passage, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of break it down into several different sections. And so we're going to kind of systematically go through uh, this chapter. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the context, and then the crimes, and then the consequences, and then finally the conversion. So those are the four sections of this chapter uh, that I've broken it down into, and then at the end we'll uh, grab some core takeaways to, to take with us. So let us start today with uh, the context. The first three verses of 1 Kings 21. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So we'll pause there for a second. Um, so let's, let's look at the context. And um, I'm going to break it down by looking at four of the key figures in this story. Okay, and the first one, we've already met him, is Naboth. So who is Naboth? Well, Naboth is a man who feared the Lord. And that is, uh, that's pretty significant in this uh, time of the nation because many of the people did not at this point in time. Many of the people had kind of switched over to Baal worship, but not Naboth. He still feared the Lord. And he had inherited this vineyard. And this vineyard to him was uh, rather significant. I mean, it's not just a piece of property. So if we backtrack, I mean, you, you know the story of the nation of Israel, right? They were, they were captives within Egypt, and they, they broke free, crossed the, the, the Red Sea. Uh, they went into the wilderness. They spent those 40 years there. And then God took them into the land of Canaan, into that promised land, okay? And it is likely that when that happened, and as they were kind of parceling out portions of land, that this land was passed on to Naboth's family. And then generation after generation, it was passed down and passed down and passed down. Which is to say that for Naboth, this isn't just land. This isn't something just to be purchased and sold or bartered for. No, this is a gift from God. And so that is why he wasn't willing to just kind of sell it. And then we have Ahab. So Ahab, we've met him. He is the king of Israel at this time. So within this history, uh, we have the divided kingdom. So the northern kingdom is Israel. The southern kingdom is Judah. And King Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom. And he reigned there for 22 years, roughly from about 850 to 900 years B.C. He was an expansionist ruler, which is to say that he took on a number of building projects, uh, he also took on a number of military battles. And so this, this vineyard that he wanted for a vegetable garden was part of that expansion, expanding his palace. And he was willing to pay for it or trade for it or what have you. Uh, the other thing of note is Ahab was married to a woman named Jezebel. So who is Jezebel? Well, Jezebel is not a Hebrew woman. Uh, she is from a city called Sidon. So she is a foreign, uh, a foreign lady who was the daughter of a king, king of Tyre. And when she came in and she married Ahab, she convinced Ahab to abandon the Yahweh religion and instead to adopt her own religion and try to make it as, as the national religion, which was to worship Baal. And so that's the direction that she tried to take uh, the nation. And as she did that, uh, she had many of Israel's prophets killed. And she instead tried to institute her own prophets in the land. Sp 
speaking of prophets, the fourth character I'd like to introduce you to is Elijah. And you've probably heard Elijah before, a very you know, well-known prophet of the Old Testament. Well, he is a contemporary of these three people, okay? And you probably remember the story of Elijah where he's up on Mount Carmel, right? And he challenges those, those other prophets, the, the prophets of Baal, to this contest. And he says to them, right, so, so you will have an altar. You'll make an altar, and I'll make an altar, and you'll have your cow, and I'll have my cow. And, and here's the catch. You can't light your, your, your altar on fire, okay? You just have to pray and we'll see what happens. And you pray to your God, your Baal God, and see if he consumes uh, your sacrifice. And, and so they did it, and he said, well, you go first. And, and, and they were praying and praying and praying, and then they prayed some more, and they prayed some more, and, and eventually Elijah started kind of teasing them a little bit and say, hey, you know, maybe your God's asleep, you know, pray a little louder or something, right? And, and, and it didn't work, and, and then it was Elijah's turn, right? And so Elijah, you know, he said, okay, well, here we go. Well, actually, before we start, why don't you, can you bring me some water? Let, let's dose this thing. And, and, well, maybe more water and more water. And, and he just drenched the altar. And then he prayed out to God, and fire came down. The, the sacrifice was gone. The altar, gone. Even the land around it was scorched, all right? So that's Elijah. That's this Elijah. And after this incredible feat of God, this power that was demonstrated right before Elijah. I mean, I mean, he was used by God in this moment. And you think of, of how emboldened he must have felt. But he then hear, heard that Jezebel wanted his head. She wanted him dead. And he goes into hiding. And so we actually haven't heard or seen of him since that point. Okay, so that story actually happened just a few chapters before, and we haven't seen or heard from Elijah until now, and now we're about to uh, see him once again. So that gives you um, a little bit of the, the context. So now what we're going to do is we're, we're going to get into the kind of meat of the story, and we're going to look at the crimes. Verses 4 to 16. So Ahab went home, sullen and angry, because Naboth the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. He lay on his bed, sulking, and refused to eat. His wife, Jezebel, came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered to her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you an, another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said, is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed his seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people, but seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them testify that he has cursed God, both God and king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth city did as Jezebel directed in the letter she had written to them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him and brought charges against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed both God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, get up and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, that he refused to sell you. He is no longer alive but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Crimes. I see more than one crime here. I mean, there's maybe one obvious, but I, I see at least kind of four crimes that I'd like to highlight this morning. The, the first, the, the obvious one, is Jezebel has Naboth killed. Naboth, an innocent man, as I said before, he feared God. Uh, Jezebel comes from a monarchy where if the king wants something, he takes it. 
That's what she was used to. So in her mind, the fact that her husband, Ahab, wouldn't do that showed him to be a weak king. And she was disappointed in him. And Jezebel demonstrates her, her cunning, her awareness. She, she was actually quite smart here in how she, she played this out by having two men bring charges against Naboth. And the reason she did that is that according to Israel law, uh, in order for a capital offense, you had to have not one, but two witnesses. And so she had the two witnesses. And the accusations, the, the, those false accusations, is that he cursed God and he cursed the king. So to say he had you know, blasphemy as well as treason. And these were, were crimes that warranted capital uh, punishment. So that's, that's the first crime. The second one, though, we see that Jezebel uses a sacred ordinance to, to complete this, this evil act. I mean, it's one thing to go out and kill someone, but she actually does it under the auspices of a religious fast. So why was a fast called? Well, the reason you would call a fast is because it would be believed that God is, um, is unhappy with the nation. And you call a fast because you want all the people to kind of gather around and to, to, to pray and to seek God's counsel and to find out, you know, where is the sin in this nation? And it'd be believed that, you know, God would reveal that to you and you would root out that sin and, then, and you'd appease the Lord. And you really consider the irony that it was Naboth, the man who feared God, who was rooted out for doing evil, by Jezebel, who is the leader of all these false prophets, the Baal prophets. So incredible irony here. The third crime that I see is that the elders and the nobles join in. Right, again, Jezebel didn't just do this on her own. She wrote that letter with her husband's seal. So <clears throat> they knew it was a ruse. They knew it was a setup, and they followed suit. Now, you might argue that, you know, we should give them some level of leniency because they did have orders from the king. I mean, it came from his letter, his seal. And in a kingdom, when a king tells you to do something, you do it, right? So I don't know if that's a legitimate defense, but even if it is, um, I believe that they knew it was coming from Jezebel. And the reason I believe that is because after they, they carried out the act, they reported back to Jezebel, not to Ahab, that Naboth has been stoned to death. So that's, that's sort of the third crime that I see. And then we have the fourth crime. And, and the fourth crime, to be fair, is not a crime in, in the judicial sense. So I am kind of stretching the word crime a little bit to fit this in, but I'm going to do it nonetheless, because uh, it really is a shame. And, and that is that the crime is that Ahab really lacks character. He really lacks a, a, a emotional uh, sort of a regulation. So let's review what happened. Ahab makes this request for a piece of land. A reasonable request, offered to pay for it. Fine. He did not get what he wanted, because Naboth didn't want to sell him that land. Fine. But then what happened? In verse 4, so Ahab went home sullen and angry. And then later it says, he lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. Let me say that this behavior is completely warranted by a two-year-old. I should know this. I have one. Spencer is two and a half now. And sometimes I will say to Spencer, Spencer, you know, it's time to go and use the washroom. And sometimes Spencer will go to the washroom, sometimes even with singing. And sometimes I will say to Spencer, Spencer, it's time to go to the washroom. And sometimes Spencer 
will drop to the floor and go, no, 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 and wail and cry and scream. And let me just say that that response is completely warranted. It's even healthy. He's two. He is two. That is what is supposed to happen. He needs to do that. He's two. He needs to, to, to push boundaries to kind of figure out where they are. And I, as his father, needs to be the one to be there to say, I'm sorry, I know you want to play with your cars, but it's time to go to the washroom. We'll play with cars later. That response is completely warranted for a two-year-old, but it is not warranted for an adult, and especially not for a leader, and especially, especially not for the king. And that's what we, say, that's what we see here. So while Jezebel executed this act of, of Naboth's assassination, what do we see from Ahab? He's just lying around, sulking, in shameless complicity. What should we have seen from him? Well, what we should have seen is we should have seen him responding to his wife, no, dear, I've got this. I'm just a little bit disappointed, but it's not the end of the world, and I'll be over this by tomorrow. That's what we should have seen. You know, before I came up, we played that clip of, of Kevin Hart. You know, and, and here again, we have an example of, of an adult who wants something, who wants his way. Now, now, I mean, he did point out that there was the little issue of intoxication happening. So I don't know if that changes things a little bit, but really it doesn't. It comes down to the same thing, which is the ability to kind of calm yourself down, to regulate your emotions, to say, no, this is not right. And, and, and certainly, when you take in alcohol or other substances, your resolve is weakened. Your ability to, to regulate your own emotions are weakened. But whether it is because of, of drugs or alcohol or whether it is because of simple immaturity or rage or revenge, when you're not able to manage your own emotions, bad things happen. Unless you're two. We, we've spoken about this in this church uh, several times, it was first actually introduced to us uh, from Cheryl, uh, talking about um, bearing uh, your burdens. And, uh, and I know Scott Wheeler's also talked about this several times, you know, boulder burdens versus knapsack burdens, right? And, and boulder burdens are those burdens that, you know, a person can't genuinely be expected to carry on their own, right? Big burdens, like your house burns down or something of that nature, right? But then there's those, those backpack burdens where you know, we need to let people carry their own burdens, right? And Ahab, King Ahab had a burden here. He really did. He wanted that land, and he didn't get it. And that is a burden, but it's a burden that he needs to bear himself. You know, and Kevin Hart, he had a burden. He wanted to go down and hold that trophy. And, and the real shame in that story is that he made it as far as he did. <laughs> so many people carried his burden for him rather than saying, no, 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 I really do mean no, you're not going down there. At least, at least in that story, at least he had a spouse who actually did try to stop him, unlike King Ahab, right? Three times he tried to stop him and he kept going, right? There are some burdens in our lives that you need to carry for yourself. And this was one of them, and he didn't. So let, let's move on to the consequences. So we're looking at verses 17 to 26, and then I'm going to just dabble in the last part of verse 29. So verse 17, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, Go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria, he is now in Naboth's vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. 
Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. Ahab said to Elijah, so you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. I am going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Baasha, son of Ahijah, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites. The Lord drove out before Israel. And then skipping down to the latter part of verse 29, it says, I will bring, which is God will bring, it on his house in the days of his son. So let's look at some consequences. There's sort of three, three big consequences that I see here. Uh, the first one, the most obvious one, is that the deaths of Jezebel and Ahab are predicted. Now, there's a lot of custom, a lot of Jewish custom around death and the burial of a body. And that's probably not that surprising. I think there's a lot of cultures that they incorporate a lot of customs and, and that really speaks to the, the, how sacred it is when someone passes away and how you treat that body. Just some of the things that happen in, in uh, that Jewish culture. Uh, bodies are generally buried within a few hours to a day of the death. Um, as soon as the breath is gone, it is the responsibility of the oldest son or the next of kin to shut the deceased's eyes and to close the mouth or the jaw. The death is then announced and mourners are brought in, oftentimes professional mourners. Uh, and the body is not left alone. From the point of death to the point of burial, Never is that body alone. There's always people accompanying it. Uh, the body is dressed and oftentimes washed or even anointed. And, and there's a whole bunch of other rituals, but I just want to give you a sense of some of them that exist that, because this is a sacred, a really sacred time. <laughs> my, my wife shared this story with me. Uh, she was working one day at the clinic where she works and there was this, this large bang and, and she and some of her coworkers, they went outside to see what had happened. And there was this, this bird, a rather large bird of some sort, that had hit the window and then just, and, and, and died. And, and it was there. And, and there was one coworker who had a rather uh, demonstrative and emotional reaction to this. Um, and this coworker insisted that he take this, this bird, this corpse, into the clinic, uh, into the freezer in the clinic. And um, the, the other coworkers had, had uh, insisted that no, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, and, and so fine, um, and, and so he took the bird and said, and left it in the, the back of his truck. Uh, and he took it home with him. And uh, this, this really happened. He, uh, he took it home. And, and the time of year, it was right towards the, the, the end of winter, early spring. So, so the ground was still quite solid, right? Uh, and so he took it home so that he could, he could take it into his house and, and freeze it uh, so that he could hang on to it until the, the ground had softened so he could properly bury this bird. His wife, however, was more like-minded with the coworkers than with him. And as such, not being able to take this bird and freeze it, and not being able to dig up the earth and, and bury it, unfortunately that bird had to go out in the trash. Regardless of what you think of birds, can I just say 
that the, the level of dignity and compassion shown to that bird was far and above what was predicted for Ahab and Jezebel. I, I mean, to suggest that dogs would be licking up their blood upon their death was completely disgraceful. It is to say that when you die, your body will not be properly treated, will not be properly buried. You will not be properly remembered. And that is the, the first consequence that we see. And, it, and the prediction that is fulfilled in the case of Jezebel. In the case of Jezebel, we see it fulfilled later on in uh, 2 Kings chapter 9. Uh, as for Ahab, uh, I'll explain that as we go along, but it does get fulfilled with uh, Jezebel. The second consequence that we see is that the name of the monarchy is tarnished. It is really tarnished. Now this is obviously implied by the first point, that if, if, uh, uh, you know, if people are not properly treating the body, there's a good chance it's because people just don't care about you, and that's the case here. But beyond that, consider how Jezebel carried out that plot, right? She didn't just kill Naboth herself. No, no, no. She involved the elders and the nobles in the plot. And while they may have been complicit, they were very aware of the character of Jezebel and of Ahab. And you know that if they were aware, their family, their friends, were, would have gotten around. I was working at this one organization, and there was a manager, and she came into the room one day, and, and there was two coworkers. She, she, she called them to sit down. I wasn't there, but I heard the story. She called them to sit down, and she asked them, in reference to a different coworker who was not there, give me the dirt on so-and-so. And she wanted to gather information so that she could get rid of, fire, uh, this, this other worker that she didn't care for. You know, regardless of whether or not you are complicit in moments like these, moments where someone is asking you for the dirt, moments where someone is asking you to carry out a crime with you, what does that do to your perception of that person? And so we see the reputation of the monarchy is tarnished. And then related to that, we get to our third point, which is the children of Ahab and Jezebel are impacted. Um, they're impacted in a few different ways. You know, it says at the end of this chapter that God will bring it, so his consequences, his wrath, on the house of Ahab in the days of his son. You know, I don't know about you, but I think to me, to probably a lot of us, that doesn't seem fair, right? It just doesn't seem fair. Why would the children have to pay the consequences of the parents' sins, of their crimes? Well, whether fair or not, let, let's look at it from a practical perspective. If the reputation of Ahab and Jezebel are tarnished, what is that going to do to people's perceptions of their children? Think about it, you know, you, you think of a, a, you know, a particular person or a particular family, and there's a few family members and they're kind of not the most um, reputable people. And you start to kind of color the whole family in that light. I mean, I mean we all kind of do it, whether we should or we shouldn't. Right? And so that reputation that was warranted for Ahab and Jezebel, people are going to look at their children and see them in the same light. Uh, the other thing I'd like you to consider is how are those children likely to turn out? Now this is not a guarantee, but think about it. Like, like you have a mother here who is conniving, egotistical, elitist, 
You have a father here who has no backbone, who is emotionally erratic, who is hypocritical. With parents like that, what chance do the children have? And so the consequences we see there is that sure enough, later on we find out that uh, the son of Ahab, Jehoram, is an evil king. No surprise there. And I'm sure if Jehoram repented, much like we're about to see Ahab, the consequences would be changed. But the Lord's prediction is that he will take it out on, on Jehoram. And so the consequences, the children of Ahab and Jezebel are greatly impacted by their sins. But then that brings us to kind of the bright spot of, of the chapter. And that brings us to the, the end few verses, verses 27 to 29, where we see the conversion. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. The conversion. Two points I'd like to make here. First one is that Ahab repents and God relents. God wants to show you his mercy. He really, really does. And in spite of all that Ahab had done, Ahab now becomes humble. You know, we see this with him tearing his clothes, putting on sackcloth, and walking around meekly. He is humbled, and God sees that humility, and God restores him. Now, I'd like to say that this is the the perfect example of repentance. And and there's a lot we can learn from this, because he really is humble. Um, But I'd be a little bit disingenuine if I said this was the the perfect example, because unfortunately, and we don't see it here, but later on in Scripture we find out that that plot of land, um, Ahab never gave it back. I mean, of course he couldn't give it back to um, Naboth. Naboth is dead, but he never gave it back to the family. He, He hung on to it. But nonetheless, God shows his mercy. Um, but then the, the other point that I'd like to make here is that in spite of God showing his, his mercy, it doesn't mean that all natural consequences are averted. Problems still turn out. So Jehoram, Ahab's son, as I said, he is an evil king. And as he reigns, a guy by the name of Jehu leads a coup and overtakes the kingdom. And so that dynasty does come to an end. Although it doesn't come to an end with Ahab, it comes to an end with his his son. And so here we see uh, another natural consequence. You know, it it reminds me of another biblical passage, uh, the story of Samson. And you probably know that story well. Samson was blessed with this great strength and it was somehow connected to his long hair. Uh, But through sin, he lost that strength. And through sin, he was captured by his enemies, the the Philistines. But if you look at the very end of his life, he is there, he is praying before God. He He is humbled. And God forgives him. But there he is in the temple, the Philistines, they have him, have him chained to the, these two pillars. And on his, his last moment, as he's praying out to God, and God, God restores him, and God restores his strength as well. And Samson pulls down these two pillars, and, and the entire temple comes down, and, and, and many, many, many Philistines are killed on that day. But might I also point out that Samson dies. He dies because of his sin. And he dies there in the presence of his enemies. God wants to restore you. But sometimes as we are restored spiritually, that doesn't always mean that all natural consequences are averted. Sometimes you hear people who commit horrendous crimes and they they, they go to prison. And sometimes they find God in prison. 
and they cry out to him and they, and they repent and they're forgiven. Sometimes they even uh, you know, apologize to their victims or their victims' families and sometimes even they will, will forgive them. But they still have to serve out their time. Not all consequences are averted. So there we have the, the, our story for today. The context, the crimes, the consequences, and the conversion. But let us finish it off just to kind of uh, touch on some of those core takeaways that we learned from this, this story. So the first takeaway is don't kill people. It's bad. <laughs> I don't know if I really need to uh, spend a lot of time here, but uh, I mean, it's there in the passage, so I, I figured I'd point it out, you know. Maybe there, you have that brother-in-law that you really don't like. Well, I'm sorry, that option has to come off the table, okay? Not allowed. Uh, okay, number two, unmanaged emotions can get you into trouble. You know, and, and maybe if there's a lot of this story that you can't relate to, you know, killing and monarchs and, and, and you know, royal seals, maybe, maybe this is an area that some of us can relate to. You know, maybe, maybe you're someone who struggles with anger or anxiety or with rage or revenge. And that can get you into trouble. And if that's, if that's a part where you are kind of, you know, feeling a little nudged by God, I mean, that's a, that's a place to really go before God and ask him for help. To seek counsel. Third point is to consider how much your name is worth. In this world, you will have many, many opportunities to take shortcuts. You have many opportunities to steal, to take from your employer. You know, if um, you know if, if if you're not happy in your marriage, to to go and have an affair to try to find happiness there. All sorts of shortcuts in this life. Rather than talking to someone kind of calmly who's really frustrating you, just to blast them, that's another shortcut. But consider what your name is worth. Consider the true cost of those actions. The next point is that others are impacted by your actions. Others are always impacted by your actions. You know, sometimes for some sins, we try to lie to ourselves and we try to tell our, ourselves, you know, no one is really going to be impacted by this sin, right? Like, like no one's going to find out. If anyone is impacted, really, it's just going to be me. And as long as I'm okay with the consequences, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Others are always impacted. If they're not impacted directly from, from your sins, then they're impacted indirectly because it impacts your character. And your character impacts how you relate to others. And then the last point is the point of hope, which is that if you have been struggling in some of these areas and you feel some level of shame, that God wants to forgive you. Humble yourself, repent. Because God wants to meet you there. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that in times where sometimes we feel a little frustrated, a little hot-headed, where we act without thinking, we thank you that you are there ready to forgive us, ready to restore us. Lord, we thank you that there are times where, yes, we've made mistakes and, and we have to pay for them, but thank you for the opportunity to learn and to grow from those times. Lord, my prayer would be that you help us to hear from you ahead of time. Help us not to head down that road. And help us to be a word of, to be able to give a word of wisdom and encouragement to those who are heading down that road. Thank you for the examples of, of Ahab and Naboth 
Elijah. And Lord, let us, let us sit with some of these truths this week. Pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Um, why don't we get the baskets going around, and then we'll uh, uh, do that. Um, so uh, if you're new to this church, uh, we uh, give offering through uh, two sets of baskets. The first set of baskets that uh, are going to go around are the outies. That's uh, baskets you take out of uh, cards or pens, offering envelopes. And then the second set of baskets is where you put everything back in. So we'll get those going around. Thank you for those who are helping in that area. And um, yeah, do we have a little bit of time for Q and A, or, or or maybe we'll just go uh, to? Uh, is there a video? First song. Okay. All right. Thank you. Maybe we'll uh, go ahead and stand. I know some of you are kind of writing things out, whatever, but uh, do the best you can, if you would. We're going to um, do white flag. 